Hi, Andrew Austin here and welcome to an Austin on Air Napier Election Candidates Debate Special right here on Radio Kidnappers, the voice of Hawke's Bay. Uh, this is also going to appear on Hawke's Bay app as a video, um, so I um, hope you all um, can, can watch that. Uh, the candidates with me at the moment, in no particular order, are uh, Nationals Katie Nimmin, Deborah Burnside of the New Conservatives, and James Crow of the Green Party. Stuart Nash is going to be joining us shortly. Um, Judy Kendall cannot, of the ACT Party cannot make it, and uh, the other people um, who are standing in the election but not participating are independent candidates Ian Gaskin and John Smith. Thank you for joining me, three of you. How are you all doing? Very well, thank you. Great, thank you. Andrew? Good stuff. Marvelous. Okay, well, what we'll do, um, we'll start with a, a general question. It's been a crazy year and COVID-19 has had a serious impact on our local economy. Um, how do we revive the economy and get people back in employment? Who wants to start, Katie? Oh, I will. Yeah. So, I mean, the most important thing is just creating creating jobs for people because so many have lost them. Um, and I think a lot of people ask me the question, how are we going to do that? I mean, we've got to borrow. That's not the question. It's what we spend that money on and investing in infrastructure and things that are actually going to help us be more productive and make more money back. But investing in industry is vital and uh, people say well how do you do that well the tech sector for us in New Zealand is huge it's a hundred thousand jobs ready to be taken and you know the kids of the future they're, they're growing up with phones attached to their hands they're learning this stuff um, so National has uh, proposed a thousand uh, STEM scholarships for kids in schools uh, low decile particularly they've got the skills and can do that and that's going to be a future industry for us to grow our economy so how's that going to be particularly benefit your electorate Napier well, I mean, look at uh, Wairoa, for example, perfect example there, is that there is a brilliant new uh, graphics and media institution that they've got 16 <coughs> apprenticeships, 16 apprenticeships for kids that have come from Wairoa College that can't learn media, graphics and design at school because it's not offered. But these kids are creating amazing things and within a year they're going on to start their own businesses. Mm. Uh, and that's in Wairoa. They've got a digital hub there that is growing by the day. Yeah. So, Deborah, what, what do you think the, the key is? Well, I'd have to agree with Katie. We have to deal with the economy and creating jobs. So we were one of those businesses that was essential during the shutdown, and it became very apparent that... Um, just exactly what we do need to survive out in our community and what kind of businesses um, do continue and can continue. So clearly tourism is, is off for quite some time yet. So we have to we have to rethink what we do, particularly in the Bay, because we you know do rely not just on the primary sector but also on that tourism sector. So we have to diversify in that area and and help get people into the Bay and get people into jobs. So New Conservative have a COVID recovery plan, a, a full um, plan of how we think we should tackle the environment. So on the radio, I can't give you all of those points, mm. but I'd love people to go and jump on the website and actually look at that plan and also look at the economic plan. Because what we have within the party are people like me, people who actually work in businesses. So over 70% of New Conservatives candidates own or operate a business of their own. We're frontline people, we're not bureaucrat bureaucrats, we're not career politicians, we're people who actually understand how yeah. to make jobs because we make them. And uh, James, um, what's the Green sure. Party's view on this? Look, I think before coming into COVID, we obviously had a, a really large crisis on our hands too, and that's climate change. Now that's not gonna go away, but it gives us opportunities as well around how we employ because we needed to mobilize a hell of a lot of people to start solving some of the issues around climate change and even within the region. So our wetland planting, some of the diversification of how we're going to have our agriculture working, that needs hands. And luckily we were able to actually get quite a lot of money out of the 2020 budget. I think it was about $1.3 billion actually to help get people into those clean green jobs. And we've now got the labour force. We just need to help skill them up bring them to the areas where they can hopefully find housing, that's another challenge for us here in the region, and then get them on those new vocational outlooks. There are things that can be done, and the Green Plan was already there to do it, but now it's not just tackling climate change, it's tackling unemployment around COVID, but they do go hand in hand. So specifically, Napier Electorate, what are the opportunities for that sort of scheme Yeah. Yeah, so, so a couple of those ones already coming out is there was an announcement the airport we're putting in a large amount of solar power, 
So we're looking yeah. to put a lot, lot of work into that, and that'll require a lot of technicians, engineers, and labor. So all the way down the supply chain, the scale, there'll be people working on that system. Plus, a lot of people are reaching out now looking at how they're going to move towards regenerative farming and agriculture because it is one of those big green ticks that the world wants to see from countries like New Zealand, and we need to help support farmers and agriculture to convert some of their land to those new sources of income because they are businesses if they don't keep up with the trends it's going to be tricky can't fight the trend the trend is global they want to see more sustainable output from farms and from horticulture and well, we're going James, to help do I'd that. have to argue that New Zealand farmers are the Please most sustainable right farmers in, in the world to be honest and that's awesome yeah but um, it's all very well for you to, to claim credit for um, things that people are doing anyway. What is your party as the guardians of the green movement, if you like, doing to actually create those employments? You've said uh, or, um, Hawke's Bay Airport and that is doing things, but mm -hmm. that's not green party mm -hmm. policy. That's not what you... Well, it absolutely is. Yeah. I mean, the only reason... But we can say it's not, right? But, but it is. You, you didn't decide to do that, you know? It's no, fundamentally we did, because when we put in some of the systems around climate change and carbon, there were different pressures put onto businesses which helps to push them in new directions. That was part of what Greens went into government to do. We went in there just to basically sit on the sideline and say, please think about climate change. We put in systems that actually made businesses consider how they were going to offset their carbon in the future. A direct result of that was the solar power system going out of the airport. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a direct result of Greens being in government with a strong partner in Labour. Welcome, Stuart. Nice segue. And saying, look, we need to do things further and faster on climate change, but that can be an economic benefit for the country. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing. Yeah, yeah I, I don't agree with James at all on this offsetting carbon at all. That is just money out of New Zealand. It's $1.4 billion a year. Um, and the ETS is significant, the Emissions Trading Scheme. I, I see it in my business, how it's applied to every single business in the Bay. It's, it's charged at the tip face on every tonne. Uh, a carbon unit is around $30 a, a unit, so it basically translates to $30 a tonne, and that puts massive costs onto productive businesses who create jobs. So I, don't, I can't really appreciate you saying, oh, green jobs, green jobs, because actually what the Green Party has done is do nothing but load cost onto New Zealand businesses, particularly in the Bay. You know, I, our, our party is, we want that gone. We want the ETS gone. It does nothing, and it impacts every single business in the Bay. At this point, I just want to um, welcome Stuart Nash, the current incumbent MP and um, Labour Party Minister. Thanks for joining us, Stuart. Thanks, Andrew. I do apologise uh, for being late. I had something urgent I need to attend to, but it's great to be here. No, that's all good. Well, what we've been talking about is uh, COVID recovery, and then we sort of uh, moved on to specific things for your electorate. So um, what we'll do is we'll carry on down the line and then get to you, and you can have a, a double hit. You can talk about broader COVID recovery plans that uh, your party's got, and then also specifically what you see um, the way forward for the Napier electorate is as well. So Deborah, we want you. You, you, um, you, um, you've rebutted uh, um, James there, but um, specifically, what do you see as um, uh, schemes that could be of benefit to uh, Napier? To Napier, that is uh, specifically. That ETS going is of benefit to Napier. We, we have a huge horticulture industry. We have a huge farming and primary industry here in the Bay. And removing that cost structure from them is significant because it impacts on absolutely everything. Um, we were talking the other night about REC workers. Well, New Conservative has a policy of getting them. We want those workers here. They need to come here. We, we, we can't hold them up. There's an orchardist here locally who, uh, in the last season, they only ended up with, a th uh, with a, well, they got a third less of the people that they actually required. So instead of talking about airy fairy stuff, this is specific stuff. Hawke's Bay needs RSA workers to get crops picked and harvested. But those jobs are already here. So if we're talking about an economic recovery, we're talking about new jobs, new ways of, of paying back the debt that we've already got. Yep. Um, so, so, you know, what are we going to do that's new? Yeah. And that's about investing in new industries. Yes, I think you meant RSE workers because RSA workers oh, will sorry, be something RSA, completely yes. different. Yeah, please don't worry, <laughs> RSA members. We're not I thought I did say RSA, field. so yeah. maybe it was just my enunciation today, yeah. Mr. Austin. Um, so, Katie, specifically, what are uh, COVID um, projects in Hawke's Bay that your party would um, bring to the table? 
Well, if we're talking about projects, I'd really love to see the Cranford Hospice actually get a look in for the Shovel Ready uh, projects because that one really blows my mind that it didn't. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Stuart, but you sit next to Shane Jones in Cabinet, do you? I do indeed. Yes, you have the air of the man that's uh, potentially calling himself the, the king of the provinces. Um, you know, an $11 Maybe million... Maybe not after their yeah. elections, <laughs> <laughs> $11 million dollars, uh, to a private green school in Taranaki, but uh, $17 million for for Hawke's Bay Region um, for the Cranford Hospice would be amazing. So so that certainly, it's not just the construction companies, because those are existing jobs, right? They move from one pre- project, they go on to the next. This is, you know, potentially quadrupling the Cranford Hospice as it is. More doctors, more nurses, more orderlies, more caterers, more caretakers, more cleaners, everything. So that would be one little project. But, you know, as I say, investing in a new industry, you know, be it media, tech, film, everything that involves new skill, new export, new productivity, that's what we need to do. So Stuart, the broader vision and then specifically um, for Napier as well. Sure. Well, you know, this election, whether we like it or not, is about how we respond and recover from COVID. And uh, I think, you know, you have two choices. You have a national uh, party who is promising a whole lot of tax cuts. I mean, I end up with $58. My mother on a pension ends up with $8, as does every other pensioner and person on the minimum wage. Or you can have a government like ours that does have a vision and a plan for growing New Zealand. And it's basically around jobs, positioning ourselves for the future, um, uh, supporting our small business owners and, um, uh, and going very hard. And you know, when I hear uh, when I hear Deborah talk about the ETS and how it needs to go, I, I would completely and utterly reject mm-hmm. that. You know, we are a small country at the bottom of the world. We uh, we have an enviable uh, reputation for doing things well. We're leaders in key areas, and ETS and climate change is something that we we led under the Clark government, uh, under the key government that dropped off. And I think one of the things that the previous national government did really, really poorly was not work hard to enhance and maintain our global brand. It's what we stand for, it's what we sell to the world, it's it's our true global um, competitive advantage. And if we don't work really hard to enhance that, then people in the Bay here who, uh, you know, who are sending apples and, and all manner of goods will not get the prices that come with being associated with brand New Zealand. So everything we do has to be enhancing our global brand and if we do that well then our region will do incredibly well i mean i you know if you look at um uh, merchandise sales exports we are eight percent up on august last year and that's mm-hmm. predominantly on the back of strong fruit prices uh, and our agricultural prices and that is because people still need food but not just any food they want food from new zealand and that brand new zealand is incredibly important and you know, I hear people say, look, there's only 5 million of us, there's 8 billion people, what difference can we make? That's not what it's about as far as yeah. I'm concerned. We can make a difference, but it's about showing the world that we care. And, uh, sorry, Katie, you want to... I was just about to say, I think the national government did a brilliant job of Brand New Zealand, and I, a stat that I can give you for that, uh, back before we, we left government, unfortunately, uh, New Zealand tourism, we had... of the world's tourists, but we had 0.8% of the world's dollar value. So the people that were coming here saw New Zealand as a real place to spend money and it was seen as a high value location. You know, I think the stats, Katie, with all due respect, um, don't back that up. We had a lot of low value tourists who travelled around the country in camper vans shitting in our rivers. (laughs) You know, what we want to do as we go forward, and this this has to be part of a of a really revamped tourism strategy is to get high-end tourists who are going to spend money uh, in our hotels, in our high-end restaurants, and in our souvenir in our souvenir shops, and and you know stay in um, stay in our expensive motels. So, Stuart, why don't you support um, the Cranford uh, Hospice? Uh, shovel ready project and that's a fantastic question it's a very good i do support it i've always supported the cranford hospice my mother volunteers there in cranford hospice looked after my father in his last week so because it's a national idea is there any chance it's that neighbor it, will it, take it it's not a national idea at all um well why uh, is the money not there for it then well uh if i look at all the shovel ready project well all the projects actually that went to the infrastructure growth fund which is mm. this so this wasn't a pgf it was an id GF fund uh, project. It actually it wasn't recommended by the Infrastructure Growth Fund. I am working with Grant Robinson now to see yeah. what we can do with regard to this. Um, it is an important part of our of our local infrastructure. I do get that. Yeah. Um, it is not, of course, the only place in Hawke's Bay that undertakes palliative care. I mean, yeah. we have 
uh, about 1,350 um, care beds in our region, and that need is going to grow as our population ages. But no, I do support Cranford Hospice. I'm working with Grant to see what we can do. But oh, this is certainly not a national idea, believe me. On that. Okay, well, it so just wasn't on your list. So it's good to know that you something's in the work. Well, you know, I do, I do have a look at the uh, National Aquatic Centre, you know, $32 yeah. million dollars we've given. Yeah. Um, not Sorry, the Regional Aquatic Centre. Uh, I look at the eight extra basketball courts for the Pettigrew Green Arena. I mean, that's going to be fantastic. Both my sons play basketball. Yeah. And the one in the fourth form, um, the last game that I watched, he finished at 10.30. It's far too late for fourth formers or 15-year-olds. Yeah. Well, year 10, I should say, these days, uh, to be finishing sport. So, um, you know, there are a number of projects. When I look at the PGF money that was rolled out as part of the COVID response fund, our region got more than any other region with nearly $20 million. So there's significant benefit in having a cabinet minister as your local MP. I, I don't want you to um, take all the time. I want other people as well. But sure. um, but as the incumbent, I will start with you. We've got some candidates in this room who are standing. They want to be the MP. Others maybe are just looking after the going for the party vote. But uh, what do you regard as, uh, just briefly, your successes as uh, electorate MP? Uh, I've, look... Um, we've had three years here. When I took over, I was police spokesperson. As Minister of Police, uh, we now have 65 more police in our region with another 50 to come. Um, police numbers dropped under the uh, last five years of the previous government. Uh, we're getting cameras on our fishing boats, uh, and we've made major Finally. changes to fishing. Fishing. In terms of the COVID response, we have got more than any other region. Uh, in terms of small business owners, and Katie, you'd be well aware of the wage subsidy. I think your company's taken up both rounds of it. Absolutely, because we, we had to. Yep, we got money out the door faster than any other country. And as Minister of Revenue, as Minister of Small Business, I was at the table designing and developing and getting these packages out the door. So I think Nate has been well served by having someone who was sitting around the cabinet table experienced when these big decisions are being made. Now, last time Katie was on, she said that that's a problem, that mm. you're too busy with your um, cabinet duties and you don't pay attention to electorate. What well, do you say to that? I, what I'll say to that is I'm the only MP, actually, and I'm talking about around the country, that mm. holds street corner meetings outside of election time. So mm. every fortnight come rain, shine and hail, and believe me, <laughs> there's been a few in hail. <laughs> uh, I'm out there talking to people, give people the opportunity to come and you know, let them know the... Um, let, me know what they think the image, uh, the issues are for the people of Napier. And uh, I've been doing these now for 10 years, and I think they keep me grounded. They're a good way to keep in touch. Yeah. And I'll continue to do those if I'm uh, privileged enough to be, yeah. to continue as the MP for Napier. Now, James, what do you think Stuart did well as MP, and what do you think he could have done better? Look, it's you're never going to support everyone, right? I think something that I've been fascinated by getting into this political system and at a government level is... We have a lot of portfolios we ask our, our MPs to manage. Uh, they are crucial for the whole country. We have to give some of the time from our MP regionally to see them do benefit for the whole country. We want to move as a country. Yeah. We need our MPs to help support the country. He gives time in between that. I respect that. I mean, when you split between a couple of businesses, as I've been at times, you're never going to be able to help everyone. You've got to do what you can, where you can, and just get on with it. And I think that's what we need to make sure we do. Whoever we vote in, make sure they're going to be able to be spread across all these areas and support them in that, because it's bloody tough. Now, Deborah, James, what do you yeah. think you would have done differently? Um, well, James makes a really good point. All MPs, and I think you'd agree, Stuart, that they have to be generalists. So that's actually what I bring to the table. I have a huge wealth of experience across transport, logistics, farming. Um, but you've never, you've never been a politician, never been an MP. Well, what's the difference? If you're very good at running your own business, um, why can't you represent the people as well, you know, Stuart says he represents people and he listens to them. Well, I went to uh, the abortion debate with over 200 people in the Taradale Town Hall there, and he wasn't there. And yet he voted he voted for that legislation, and, and some people in Hawke's Bay are very angry about that. And, and yet he says he listens to the people. I don't believe he did on that issue. I, and I support my decision on that 100%, on that legislation. Yeah. And Katie, what would you have done differently in this last term if you had been MP? Mm, well, I think one of the interesting things is it's about listening to people. It's not about knowing that you know better or thinking that you know better. But Stuart says he does listen to people. Well, yeah, well, I mean, you, one, didn't. You, could yeah. Say, you could say that, but it's actually about being on the ground and being with the people. So in the last uh, couple of months while I've been campaigning, I've actually been out there learning about the communities that I'd be representing. And um, I went to a Tipahui community meeting 
which was very, very interesting. Um, but Stuart wasn't there. I've been to the Osprey meetings with the local uh, farmers in Te Pahui, Pātauka, Tūtera. Stuart wasn't there. Uh, there are a lot of concerns there that they have not had heard. Uh, and going to my, uh, my meetings, whether they're in a cafe or a pop-up on the corner of the street, you know, the people I talk to don't feel listened to. So whether they just don't know when your street corner meetings are, or they don't feel that they can. I mean, it's it's actually about listening, but not knowing that you know that you know more, listening and taking it on and seeing the bigger picture. Can I give you one example of working hard for my community? Even though you know you, you work for people who you know will never vote for you. So um, a classic case is Deborah and her husband, who you know I, Deborah runs a very successful business, and I have an immense amount of respect. I have a lot of respect for everyone around this table. Let's yeah. put that on the table. Uh, she had an issue. Um, I organised a meeting for Deb and her husband with the Minister of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, and you know I know that I know. Deb's but that's politics. your job, Stuart. I know totally. You're the local MP, and, no, and, and it was a problem we had, and we came to you, and and uh, that was your job. You get paid handsomely absolutely. for that by and the New Zealand taxpayer. No, no, so I wouldn't expect anything less. No, but my point is, is it is my job, and I love doing my job, and I will continue I'd love to, to do, do my your job. job. But my mm. point, I suppose, is you can't turn up to every meeting. I get yeah. that, and you know. Uh, Deb has talked about the abortion debate. I've listened to both sides of this argument and mm -hmm. I've made a choice. I've made my decision and I've yeah. made that clear to everyone who will listen. Same with the end of life choices. This is a really big decision. I actually polled the electorate and um, uh, you know, 65% of the electorate said they wanted me to vote for it, 14% said they didn't want me to How vote for it. Sample, what was your sample mm. size? I, took a, um, I used a, a polling company called Courier, which is oh, used yeah. by the National Party, yeah. and I, you know, I paid them, and I asked them to run a statistically valid poll, which of course they did, because they always do, and they came back with these figures. So it wasn't me phoning up a couple of mates. Yeah. This was statistically valid professional polling company. Okay. Mm. Now, just... Uh, I have a landline. They've never called me. The... There's a lot of talk about uh, National always say that they're better at Labour than running the economy. And we just had a poll that showed New Zealanders actually trust Labour um, more with the economy than um, National. But now, Katie, it sort of doesn't really help if your finance minister, Paul Goldsmith, uh, sort of loses four million, you know, it's uh, mm. four, billion. It's, uh, four billion, sorry, a little bit of a hole there. Mm. And uh, can we really trust him if you come in power? He's going to be the finance minister, the buck stops with him. Mm. I mean, surely, I mean, yeah, you absolutely can. Do you know what? There's a really interesting situation with that supposed four billion, it, it's just labels on different pots of money. The money's still there, it's just in a different pot. So ultimately, you know, it might change the GDP from, th you know, 35 to 36% in terms of where the debt sits. But that money is still there. And, and I think it's really important to realise that we had independent institutions that read the, that data and did not find that same error. So, you know, it's based on May, May budget details. Uh, you know, you come to July and, and the money has changed. But ultimately, yes, you can. You know, um, and I think that's really important to remember. It's what we choose to invest in. It's how we prioritise that money, not the exact figure. It is how we prioritise that money, and we choose to invest it in things that will continue I mean, to make us money. We've had a history of Michael Cullen, of even Bill English, of John Key. You know, financial brains, and that Grant Robertson. Some would say is really up there as well. But um, really, I don't Paul even Goldsmith? think Grant Robertson would call himself an economist in any way, would it? No, but well, he's a finance minister, and that's what I'm yes, talking he, yes, about. Yes, he's the yeah. finance minister, but he doesn't he doesn't claim to say he really understands the economy. I mean, oh, no, I think he does. Well, oh, during the COVID, he said he didn't know if there was going to be a recession and because Treasury hadn't told him yet if there would be one. No, what you, what you do as a minister, um, as, you, as you pointed out, Deb, you've got to be a generalist. What you do as a minister is you take advice from a whole lot of experts. And, and during, at the beginning of COVID, no one knew what the result was going to be. You know, they predicted Well, I'm sitting in my business and I absolutely knew there was going to be a recession based on COVID. But we didn't know if I didn't need to wait for Treasury to tell me. The other thing, Andrew, I would like to say is actually Paul Goldsmith has made now three errors, mm. which he's had to apologise for. And the money isn't always there. I mean, at the risk of getting too technical, um, National has actually only left itself $800 million to spend on everything else after their tax cuts and other policies. We, that is as much as we spent on health last year. So there has got, you know, when you, when you give out $5 billion in tax cuts to people like me and, you know, $8 to every single pensioner out there, there is not much to spend on anything else. And yeah. so three mistakes by the guy who wants to be finance minister. 
But, it um, comes down to belief, though, doesn't it, on who can spend their money best. And definitely New Conservative, and I would say the National Party as well, we believe that people can spend their money better and that they should. It's their money and they should have some back. The government gets in over $100 billion in tax income. Does it? it does. It's in, I'm, it's I'm in the, the finance minister. Oh, sorry, the are you? It's oh, that's interesting. Minutes. So there we go. It's During online. this, uh, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's online how much comes in. It's and about 80 I was actually just about to say how quickly uh, Labor changed their minister ministerial portfolios <laughs> around so there we go now Stuart Nash is the finance minister but all I'll say to yeah all I'll say to that is honestly you know as Stuart alluded to you take advice from a whole lot of people yeah. and we took yeah. our advice from a whole lot of people that absolutely know and at the end of the day they say that and our policy is still sound yeah. regardless yeah. of those little holes or but whatever uh, you want to call it I it's just still want sound. to say to you as well that people do say but you're getting us in so much debt anyway mm. it doesn't really matter what you say to that look at Grant has said Aside, Grant, the finance minister, has sent aside fifty billion, <laughs> fifty billion dollars for the COVID relief fund. Okay, yeah. we've committed about thirty-six billion of that to wage subsidy and other initiatives. So there's about fourteen billion left. What the Nats have done with that fourteen billion dollars is said five billion for tax cuts. They want to put a tunnel through the Brindurwins, uh, which leaves about, as mentioned, eight hundred million for operational costs, i.e., running government. Yeah. Uh, next year and 788 million the year after. There is just not enough money. Goldie, Paul Goldsmith. Oh, I think there's plenty of money. It's how it's spent. Well, and it's I, who's spending it. No, this yes. is, okay, well, let's go back to that point. You say it's your money. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm really happy to pay taxes if, in fact, what that is going to do is create a cohesive uh, um, society that works well. The last thing anyone wants to see is increasing levels of inequality. It is the last reason. Last election. It is the reason why we party, increased the winter last energy election, payment. Last election, your party told every taxpaying New Zealander for twenty dollars a week that they would resolve poverty and homelessness, and they have not. You can't change things in three years, Deb. It's why we need another but three years. But you told years. everyone you could. You said all you needed was this. No, don't let the National Party give the $20 tax cut. Don't vote for them. Keep your money, and we're going to solve poverty and homelessness. And here's but the what other we thing, did too. Do, we invested in schools and in education and mm. in healthcare in a mm. way the Nats had never done, and mm. I think people are now benefiting from that. So, James, um, there's a point here <laughs> that, um, that people wanting social housing has increased fourfold. Do you think this coalition government, of which your party is part of, mm -hmm. has done enough to address that issue? And I will come to you as answer that. Yeah, Stuart it's probably well. one of the only areas I do have a lot of background. Um, five years before we all started hearing about something called Housing First as a policy, I went around Auckland trying to explain that to a lot of the homeless and rough sleeping entities, and they said, "Sounds ridiculous. We don't we don't house the homeless. We we feed them, we we clothe them, and we meet them on the street." And the facts and the numbers that I was pulling up through national government data, unfortunately it was national government that was hunting for it, there was no government guidance on the numbers of people that were either sleeping rough or were inappropriately housed. That data didn't exist. It took a couple of doctors in Wellington to actually build that data and provide that, which is what then led to me taking a 10,000 person petition to the almost coming in Labour government and Jacinda received that, which was awesome, to say, look, we need a minister, we need someone to actually take action around homelessness. And they did do the deep dive and found the information. And yeah, it was far worse than we all thought it was. I'm not surprised the number's bigger than we thought. It hasn't grown, it's been acknowledged. And as it's been acknowledged, people have felt more safe to come out and say, oh, I'm not okay living in a garage. And that's now been put on the list. This is not about the number, it's about how sad that number is. It's a huge number. And yes, three years is the start of a housing first system around homelessness and more state houses. But not just that, but state houses that are warm, dry, and are going to be uh, efficient and economic, well, which Katie's is a new change. Well, wants to get rid of all of them. What do you... Well, so, uh, well, this is the interesting thing, though. It's not get rid of all of them. It's actually make it practical. And I want to say that, yes, we have a lot of people on a housing waiting list, and it is astronomical. And I've just come from a meeting where a lot of people were asking me about this. But what they're also asking me about is why why is the emergency housing system that we have, which is housing people in motels, seem like the end of the line, the end to the solution? Because it's not. Because there are a whole raft of other issues that are coming out of this, yet we seem to say, well, that's okay. You're now somewhere and you're housed and that's fine. It's not. 
And you know what we're doing to landlords is making this immensely harder because landlords like business owners and farmers, they are taking all the risk to do something for someone else. And we are making it harder for them to do that job. And you sell a, you sell a house that might be tenanted by a group of five or six people, gets bought by a first home buyer, they want to do it up and sell it on. Where do those displaced four to six people go? Hmm. They go onto the emergency housing list. And while we have an RMA that makes absolutely no sense, we are not building new houses for people to move into so that they can rent out the ones they have because not everyone wants to own, but everyone wants a place to live. And can I say just so for one, unfortunately, yeah. these are all the symptoms. Yes, the farmers, yes, the landlords, they are at the hard end of what society has done to people for so long. And we came out of nine years of that government. People didn't have enough money in their pocket <coughs> to pay their rent. If they had to put their child through uh, A&E or get support for something else in their lives, they couldn't pay their rent on time. That's what impacts landlords, is the ability for people to have enough to get by. Okay, so Deborah, quickly on this, because uh, we must move on, social housing, what's the solution? And then Stuart, you can uh, respond to all of them as well. Okay, well, um, our leader, Leighton Baker, is a builder, and that's partly why he's interested in politics. So why he's, he's going to build involved. all the houses, isn't he? He's <laughs> not going to build them all himself. <laughs> you know, don't be facetious, Andrew. Um, what, what he really does nice. want to look at, though, is... Definitely the RMA, same as the National Party. Definitely looking at building products that are that are cheaper and meet overseas standards because often their standards are higher than ours anyway. We want to look at the, the trade school option for young people to get them into trades because that hasn't been happening. Um, just Well, it has actually. National introduced the Trades Academy. We've got 600 kids in the Hawke's Bay region going to Trades Academy. We need more tradespeople. Okay. Stuart? Let's talk about Napier. So the Briefly, pre please. Pre yep. The previous <laughs> national government pulled down 132 houses and units and didn't replace one of them. Now, you have a real problem when you, when you pull down houses that are used by our most vulnerable. Well, they're also condemned and not safe to live in. Well, that's beside the point. You didn't build any. You pulled them down. You didn't build any. What so the land's been sitting there ever since and could be consented to build on. And, and why weren't they built? Housing New Zealand, under the previous government, came to me and said, we're going to pull these down and we're going to start building straight away. They didn't build one. We At least we're building. So why didn't at least they, now. Stuart? The you're need, the, oh, you're no, the government now. No, the need at the time was more predominant in Auckland, so the funding went to oh, Auckland. Oh, oh, so, I see, so it was in Auckland. No, that's not true. The other thing I'd say with regard to um, apprentices, as you're probably well aware, and a number of your listeners will be, certainly a number of the businesses are, is we are now paying, um, it is free to take to become an apprentice. We're paying uh, employers 12000 the first year, 8000 the second year. So you want to become a builder or a sparky or a plumber or anything to do with the trade, you can do it for free. We're removing one of the main barriers for people to engage in trades training. So did first year's free at university see more university students? Because I don't think it did. Uh, it's not about that, Katie. But that's what you're saying, is making trades free and we'll see more tradespeople. See, the interesting thing is that you probably possibly don't understand is when we talked about first year free, it wasn't just university. Only one third of people who accessed the first year free actually went to university. The other two thirds went to polytechnics or trade training. So in fact, what it was doing is getting a lot of people uh, out of, um, it was providing a whole lot of people with opportunities. Yeah. But EIT already no. offered that though. No, it didn't. First year free. No, it didn't. Well, it did for my brother. Well, maybe that's because you come from a wealthy family, you can afford uh, it. Absolutely not. <laughs> but what you haven't brought, brought up, though, school, is, is exactly the same as the landlords that Katie mentioned, is the extra costs okay. of building. Let's talk about landlords then. I mean, no, I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a former, about, I'm a former landlord We're talking about the extra pumps. costs of building that have come directly out of really draconian health and safety legislation. Um, I was talking to uh, an international uh, provider of waste services today, and what's going on here now is almost every day we're being asked uh, to do with compliance, and the building industry is the same. It's masses and masses and masses and masses of paperwork that doesn't make the job any safer, that we have staff members all attending to, you would be the same in the, in the transport industry, oh, yeah. where there's all this documentation, all this loading of costs, does it make what we do safer? No, it doesn't. Deb, we've just removed a whole lot of regulation out of the Building Act to make compliance a whole lot easier. The other thing also, you know, you talk about the extra costs we're putting on landlords, I mean, I make no apology for that because I think if you're renting a house, you deserve to rent a house which is warm and dry. I don't have dry. an extractor fan in my own kitchen, Stuart. Well, you that's don't a, I'm need, not talking about you, You Deb, don't need an 
a reason. It's not a good a idea. You should really, okay. really have one. You don't need an extractor fan to well, actually, be able to live in a well, house. Actually, yeah, yeah, I think illegal. you should. I think we're going to move on to a few other things because <laughs> actually we've only, illegal, you say? we've only got about okay. 20 minutes left, so <laughs> we'll move on. Um, just some more sort of Napier specific question. Gangs. Big nice. issue in, in uh, Hawke's Bay, mm -hmm. even in Napier. We had a big incident at the beginning of the year in the middle of Napier. Um, and Stuart, I'm sure you're going to tell us all the things you've done. Sure. Um, but should they actually be banned? Should we go that other step? Should we ban them from all uh, city centres, um, all council, all um, government property, everything, all over the place? I know there are some areas that are, but um, what is the solution to the gangs? James, start with you. When we say banned, we're talking about banning a, an, Patches, out, an yeah. outfit, right? Yeah, yeah. a costume. Mm. Yeah. How does banning a costume keep people who have been, been put in certain positions in life and made wrong decisions not go to town? Um, I mean, that's the idea. Right? We, we think we can just paint over it. We say, Let, we'll take off your flag and you're no longer from that country. No, no, no. That's how you've been raised. That's the situation you've been put in. This is the family that has said, come to us, we will take care of you. We'll feed you, we'll clothe you, we'll house you. So the problem doesn't start there and we can't fix it by saying, let's paint over the cracks. These cracks have been developed since we ghettoized some of the suburbs and we then said, you can live here, but now you can't. There's new rules. Now get out, the house is being bold. I have a hard time seeing how I'd feel love for the city if that's how I'd been treated. So to say then, you just can't wear that outfit to town. I'm coming to town anyway, and I'm bringing with it warts and all how I've been treated my entire life. So I think it's the wrong end again to start there. But still, everything goes back to poverty, quality, and it, it might be the wrong end, but it's still... No, the, no, it's, it's the, simply the wrong end. It just yeah. makes people feel safe. No, but and the point is, you still have it happening not. in the streets. You but still have these incidents, these, exactly. you know, these explosions well, in the street kind but of thing. But it's a start. So there is also a way of dealing. It's a start, but it's also a way, way of dealing I mean, with things. It is a start. Some starts just put people to the side again. That's not dealing with mm. any of the issues. Yeah, but can I just say that I've talked to people, I've just come from a meeting where people raised gangs as their number one issue aside from over, you know, over housing people in, in uh, motels. But down Marine Parade, every single tyre down Marine Parade was slashed by gang members last week. Yeah, and that's terrible, right? Crime is, crime is one thing. But the idea is we're talking about saying, shall we just disenfranchise a group of people more? Look, there's lots of criminals deal with the crime, but first of all, please try and deal with the issues that created these people. So how do you crime. stop the tyres on And that's, that's the absolute parade, breakdown being. of the family yeah, in New I'm Zealand. I'm sad to and say that we're probably 30, 40 years through, yeah. right? We're 30, 40 years into a system that we're not going to turn the ship around by oh. just mm. painting out, getting rid of the vest. Don't come to town and, and have a whole colour block. Mm. Yes, it makes people feel safer, but again, we're just ignoring the real root cause But it's of the intimidation issues. factor. You know, I've got people that I've talked to and spent a bit of time with in the campaign trail that have moved here from the YK and they said they've got gang members up there. They've probably got more than we do, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But we, they're not out in public and they don't feel the same power that ours do. And they are out there intimidating people because they can. So perhaps gang patches, maybe it doesn't solve the whole problem. It definitely doesn't. But it gives police the authority to move people off a property that is right, public right, space. Yeah. So like, make it illegal and then they can police what, it. Use yeah, the unfortunately, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm with James on this. You, if you're going to ban one, one group's costume, then you'd have to ban everybody's costume. Because yeah. that actually is all it is. It's a costume. And, and Stuart, um, there have been some arrests of high profile and... Uh, figureheads of these gangs and that um, what more can be done and what, what are the police doing and you as police minister? Well it is mentioned um, 65 new, new police in our district another 50 to come um, since April this year police have concluded six operations against gangs um, I, I, what, first of all what I'll say is Tanya Kura our district commander who has just been made a yeah. deputy commissioner mm. congratulations to Tanya uh, set up a gang focus unit with the number she had those six operations have um, have resulted in about 33 arrests of uh, of gang members, a whole lot of methamphetamine, weapons, cash, and assets seized, and so we're making progress. Um, one thing I will say, though, is under the previous government, police numbers fell in the last five years. Population increased by 400,000. Judith Collins said in 2011, when gangs became established, they're not Australian gangs became established, mm. they're not welcome here. The next year, police numbers fell by 150. She talks a big game. But we have delivered across the country 1,300 more police over and above 
where we were when we started. Stats though, but I don't feel any safer. I feel less safe now than I did before because I am seeing more gang members out in the community intimidating Well, people. what I would say to that, Katie, is thank goodness we have 65 more police in our region because under National, they didn't want to increase police numbers until after 2020. But, but I mean, she's right, Stuart. Gang numbers are increasing. Yep. And certainly, just anecdotally, I hear a lot of people saying mm. they've seen more of them on the street. Is that not an issue for you? It it's might, a big issue. It's a yeah, really so big issue. So how do we stop that? Uh, I mean, well, first of all, you've got to increase police numbers, give them the resources to go after these guys. And they are. Like I said, we've taken since April this year, we've taken out 33 of the gang leaders from our community. Okay, that's a start. Mm. First, secondly, they make all their money from methamphetamine. Uh, we're going really hard against the dealers and suppliers of methamphetamine, but we're also treating those who find themselves in the web addiction as a health issue as opposed to a criminal issue. Mm. But it does come down to providing opportunities. You know, young people need to know that A, they can access education, B, there are jobs, C, there are opportunities for them as opposed to gangs. Mm. One last thing I'll talk about is proceeds of crime. We're strengthening that as well. At the moment, we've um, taken over $500 million off criminals. This is across the country. Yeah. Uh, in terms of their assets, we're strengthening that so we're going to unexplained wealth. What that actually means is, you know, we can go to these guys riding $25,000 Harleys down the road and say to them, uh, where did you get that from? And if they can't provide... Um, a bona fide uh, reason or receipt, then we can take it off them. So we are making, we are going hard. Again, it's gang numbers are increasing, and it concerns me greatly. It really does. Um, and it starts right at the beginning, Stuart. With it does, no, I, it starts with I family. I don't disagree with that. And I you know what? Disagree. So I've had I've had an experience through my job, and it's very hard to stomach. I take thousands of kids to school every single day. And the number of kids that we have using their gang connections to intimidate other kids on school buses mm. at the age of eight. Mm. And I have a kid on one of my school buses that had to get kicked off for aggressive violent behaviour. He came back to me with a police officer beside him who appeared to have rehabilit rehabilitated and said, I want to go back to school because I want to get into the army. I thought, thank goodness the system hasn't failed you. Well, guess what? Weeks later, he ends up getting caught by a police dog after stealing and torching a car. This is under your watch. So your point, Katie? <laughs> My point is that it is not getting better. My point is is that it is getting better, Katie. Like I said, numbers, police numbers fell, gangs got out of control, meth burgeoned and started, you know, got a grip in our communities. You guys did nothing. We're finally dealing with this. It, you know, like I said, it, it takes time. There's 2,200 more police through police college. Record numbers, 14% increase in police. Sure, it does have to start with family. And I, I head, as a Minister of Police, I head what's called our um, uh, Social Wellbeing Committee Organised Crime Plan. And that has ministers from right across all portfolios because we do recognise you can't arrest your way out of this. It is a social problem. But if we want to go after the guys now, you need more police. You've got to give them but the resources. It doesn't, I mean, they're, they're more gang members. So how's that working? I don't understand. And I'm not seeing those police. So, so, so where if, are they? So if are you've you got serious? all those? Absolutely. You I'm, should come to one of my street oh, corner meetings. Oh, People admit that I there are I more think, police out I there. I think our Hawke's Bay mm -hmm. police are actually amazing. So yes. we, had a, we had an incident. And I'm not saying they're not amazing. Early Saturday morning. And yeah. the police were there inside 10 minutes. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. The, must, the police are there. We must move on. We've got about 15 minutes. So, um, yeah, just water. And I know water is probably your, mostly a council issue in that. But um, the deep feelings, as you all know, about the state of water, uh, drinking water and that in, uh, in Napier. But also, we're in a very drought-prone region. Mm -hmm. And we just saw what we've been through, um, the whole of Hawke's Bay in the last... Um, in the last summer, I mean, it's still having ramifications for our farmers and the growers and that now. Huge. What is what is the solution to uh, the all of water situation? Uh, Stuart, do you want to start? Well, first of all, let me say that I've always, but in terms of Napier, I do believe that we should not have chlorine in our water supply, yeah. um, and I've always gone hard on that. My, my personal view on water is if you use it to create economic wealth, uh, i.e., you know, use it as an input for production, you should pay for it. However, if it's used for life necessities, necessities, cooking, cleaning, drinking, you should not have to pay for it. Now, that is a council decision, but I'm very clear on that. In terms of our water policy, you know, the Nats have come out and said that our water reforms will be gone by lunchtime, quote unquote. Mm. We believe that you should be able to swim in our rivers, and I grew up swimming in the Tuki Tuk. Um, the Nats believe that the water should be uh, clean enough so we can wade in it. So we have quite different views around that. Um, we are in a dry region, uh, and it is one of the <coughs> main variables that influences <coughs> excuse me, the economic outcome of our region. But um, 
you know, and, and David Parker has done a lot of work around water reform. Comes back to what we stand for and what we uh, think is important as a community. And uh, you know, I think my kids should be able to swim in our rivers like yeah. I did. Yeah, look, absolutely. And uh, I think an interesting thing to consider, though, is, is uh, water storage, which we've turned our nose up at for, for years and years, especially the Rua Tanifa Dam. But would that not have made a huge difference Massive in difference. the drought that we just had in autumn? And can I say, too little too late with the $500,000 fund that came through, the same value as a slide in the Parliament grounds, to come and support farmers when it was just too late. The ground was dirt. The ground was dirt, and when the rain finally, finally came, it was just a mudslide. Farmers in tears that are just thinking, what on earth do we do? So water storage is a huge thing, and we need to be considering that. We need to not turn our nose up. But water chlorination is a really interesting one. I mean, personally, I react really, really badly to it. So do my dogs, surprisingly. They will not drink. If I put a pot of chlorine water next to a pot of filtered water, they will not drink the chlorine water. And what does that say for what we're ingesting and what we're showering in? And the concern from the people of Napier of the brown water coming through their taps doesn't go down well. And so we need to be considering what we do. But can I ask, uh, Stuart, what the Labor position is on widespread chlorination? Because you say you don't want chlorine in our water, mm -hmm. but your government wants to chlorinate uh, all of the water. Sure. No, we're putting up a, <coughs> an independent water authority. There are some um, jurisdictions that absolutely do need chlorine, uh, including Central Hawke's Bay, for example. But... Due to the nature of our confined aquifer, uh, we don't need to chlorinate our water. It is a council decision, and within the legislation uh, that enables these water reforms, there is a clause in there that allows councils uh, to exempt themselves from a chlorine but regime. But they lose the funding. No, no, they just have to prove the integrity of, the, of their infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay, Deborah, your turn. Yeah, thanks for that. So, um, absolutely, the Rua Tanafa Dam, it was interesting at Forest and Bird last week that they, they asked us about water storage and yet they had mounted a legal challenge to the dam. Um, and and I'm, I'm a staunch supporter of that dam because Robert, my husband, on uh, the Hastings District Council was the councillor that, that advanced that. So, um, definitely... We've got to look at water storage, and and we, we if we can pick that back up, we jolly well need to. If it was in the wrong place, um, it was in the wrong place. But we we need to deal with it yeah. because urbanisation is here. We need to be able to move our crop productivity mm -hmm. elsewhere. Um, no, I want to just talk about Stuart and his his charging for commercial use of water. He doesn't want the ETS gone, and he wants to charge people who are using water. Well, I want people in New Zealand to be able to afford nutritious wholesome food and when you start adding on cost and cost and cost and cost and like Katie said we had farmers who had stock starving we're nearly legacy farmers here in the bay the Burnside family and we're really proud of that and and it was it was torturous to hear and and see what was happening on Hawke's Bay farms but it will be so much the worse for charging we already for charge water for we mm -hmm. in a way we do but if you're talking about charging so that's based my on personal production. View, but, but we do actually charge for water already. Do. Yeah. So let's just move on to James. I think the Green Party uh, candidate would like to say something about water. Yeah, I'm but, sure. um, you know, <laughs> it'll, it'll all work out in the wash. Um, but look, we, 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 we do pay for water, I want to say, first of all. But uh, the, the urban centres, they actually pay the most for water. That's just a fact. It's in the rates and the cost mm -hmm. to upgrade the infrastructure because it was mm -hmm. left for so long, accepting that she'll be right. Uh, and then eventually some, some sheep poo fell in. To some water? Well, it didn't fall in. There was a massive storm. It was event. pushed in. There was and, a massive uh, and, and we storm ended up with event. a huge issue. The pumps failed. It was yep. sucked yep. back down. And so again, I think what we have been pushing for. And that for was to do with the council not raising the boreheads. So right. this will just be solved by putting chlorina uh, chlorinating the water. That's the problem, right? We could solve it that way, but it has a lot of a lot of ill effects. But hey, so let's look at Napier Council though, and this is the thing, right? We're talking about Napier here. I, mm. I I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, we've always had E. coli in the water, mm. and I have many friends that have and do work for the Napier City Council. And they say, we've always had the E. coli in the water. You might have had a crook tummy every now and again. You wonder why. Well, that's probably why. We changed the threshold mm -hmm. that we expected was reasonable. And yeah. that is when we started chlorinating. And things the had to change, right, because we, we can't go back to a disaster like that. And so I understand the why there's the water the management. The disaster was foreseeable, and, and the result was the entire country being chlorinated. So what will we do about water greens? I think one of the big things is around <laughs> that water storage. We Yeah, we, guys, we're in a, a 
climate change issue. It's going to keep going. Mm. I love to say, oh, let us intensify farming more, but then don't worry about the global impacts of us having longer droughts mm. and more infrequent rainfall. We can't have it both ways. Mm. On charging for water, as I said, the communities pay more, but water bottling, this is the things we're talking about trying mm. to charge for, guys, and everyone mm. is really mad about bottled water going offshore, yep. plus the type of agriculture that can happen some places. We can't have all our toys in all the boxes. But we also you know? can't have blanket rules for everybody when so it's only some people So every job is going to need to be looked thing. at in different ways. And the region's doing a really good job of that with the tank process. Regional Council's finally got onto that process again. It's stalled for a year because there was a lot of noise around water storage, the wrong kind of storage, and that was at Regional Council level. So that's okay. all gone now, those issues. We need to get back on with actually dealing with the effects of climate okay. change. We've and got taking about, care of our water safely. We've got about seven Kia minutes ora. left, so we'll look at the referendum issues. <laughs> um, cannabis, decriminalising cannabis. Um, Stuart, will this go through, do you think, how you vote in, and should your Prime Minister say which way she's voting on this? Uh, no, she shouldn't. It's a conscious issue. We have no party position on that, and the Prime Minister has the same vote as every other New Zealander. But if you told us what you vote in, then why can't she? Uh, I have told you how I'm voting at end of life choices. The jury is still out for me. I'm still to do research because I'm really torn on the cannabis one. Mm. I think there are very strong arguments for and very strong arguments against. But as mentioned, it is a, it is a conscience vote that means that we have no party position whatsoever on, on either of the referendum, even though end of life choices, if anyone is that interested, they can go and have a look yes. at the parliamentary record. Mm. Yeah. Mm. What's your take? How do you think they're going to go? I think my, my take is end of life choices will pass. Uh, the cannabis referendum, um, it's on a knife edge. Yeah. Mm. Katie? Yeah, interesting one. I tell everybody this shouldn't be the reason you do or don't vote for a candidate because mm. as ex exactly as Stuart has said, I have one vote, you have one vote, everyone else has one vote. It's mm. not a party position. Um, but for my point of view, uh, you know, and I talk to people about it, as I say, it's not about whether or not, you know, this is the national party view or not. I run a bus company. I, I drug test people every single month because we have to, it's a Ministry of Education contract. I know my staff aren't using, but when one of them does, his response was, oh, I can't wait till it's legalised, as if all of a sudden that's going to make it okay to yeah. drive kids to school yeah. while using marijuana. That is a common misconception. And that is the point, is Those my yeah. personal view is it is going to be an absolute of can of worms that we cannot shut back up, and I do not think we're ready for it. doesn't mean that I don't see the positives in it, but I see personally the, the, the issue we're not going to be able to shut back up. And again, end-of-life choices, I'm still doing a lot of research on it. I see both sides. I get that. And it's a very, very hard one. All I will say is if it goes through, I hope it goes through convincingly because I do not want that to be a 51-49%. Deborah? Uh, Andrew, you said decriminalisation, but it's not. It's actually full legalisation. Mm. So I think most New Zealanders cared about access to medicinal cannabinoids. We have that. I think they cared about um, young people not being criminalised for being caught with a joint. The changes to the Drugs Act have already dealt with that. That was August 2019. So personally, I'm a no. I have seen this in Los Angeles. I have seen this in... Uh, California, I do not want to see it in, in Hawke's Bay. The, the truth of legalisation is literally walking down the street with clouds of marijuana smoke enveloping you as you go. That is actually the reality. That's what it looks like. So I don't want that for New Zealand and I don't think most other New Zealanders would want it either. And that's quite aside from the, the employment issues that Katie's talking about. I'm the same. People believe that when it is legalised, they'll, they'll be able to have a joint at morning tea time. I, I they generally believe that. I don't know about that because people aren't allowed to have a slug of whiskey at morning tea no, time. No, but that's, that's, you're not listening, you don't, respectfully, you don't employ a lot of blokes. We both do. They genuinely I've got believe a couple of this. Too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 sorry, sorry, James, to leave you out. And now, I've got a whole lot of fantastic women that work for me as well. Cool. But on the Just euthanasia. Keep, quickly on euthanasia. Euthanasia used to be for, then faced my own death through my own cancer. Not interested in it now. Definitely don't think a government should be telling a doctor who has sworn to mm. never be the instrument of death to deliver death. No, we, we I don't. think it's wrong. Mm. It's a, absolutely wrong. A doctor can refuse to be part of the scheme if they want. Oh, yes, we'll see. James, you're up. Uh, look, it's, the thing about being on the trail has been fascinating, the trail. Uh, at their <laughs> Great Power meeting, it was, it was uh, two-thirds for euthanasia because mm. that's an issue they're really yeah. facing. 
two thirds against cannabis because it's something that's not really part of their lives. I think it's going to all come down to how we see it affected. Yeah. Mm. I'm glad we've got strong work, work, our health and safety, uh, because that's what will keep my staff protected. They understand there'll be more funding that comes out of legalising this. Right now, I believe a lot of the issues around really cannabis can't even be discussed in government because it's an illegal substance. Mm. We can't put funding towards different research projects and education systems for staff because mm. it's in a grey zone. The don't longer make we domestic leave these violence in legal zone. to help people who've got aggressive problems. Well, it's, you know, mm. I mean, mm. wherever that's going. But um, mm. for me, of course, I've, I, I don't know a single person um, who has not been in contact with cannabis in their life. And I know very few people who it has affected negatively. It's part of life. We need to decide either way. And it's non-binding. Let's get it out into the public. Put some light on Actually, it. Actually, that okay, accident earlier on Saturday morning, minutes, that so was cannabis. We've got less than two minutes, so uh, literally... One sentence on why people should vote for each of you. You go, James. We've done more for the climate in three years than previous governments have done in 30, but we need to get back in and go further and faster. So a party vote for Green is a party vote for more of that change you've seen. And we've got to go. We've got to be back in there to get more done. Okay, that's Kyoto. more than a sentence. But uh, Deborah. So our MMP environment allows Napier voters to have two MPs and Stuart's going to be there anyway as number 12 on the list. Don't waste your vote on Stuart. Please give it to me. I absolutely would be honoured to be the MP for Napier and that is what I'm working really hard for. Yeah, but uh, Katie thinks that's her. her that's spot. exactly right. And, and honestly, we need somebody that has got youthful, dynamic energy that is going to listen to people, that listens and paints a big picture. And the National Party, we are the party of practical environmentalism. We are the party of listening to people, collaborating, giving people the support that are already out there, knowing that they're doing the right thing, that we can get them to go further. So party vote national and a candidate vote for Katie Nimmin. We're going to see a change to Napier. Stuart. And Jacinda, you've got a leader who is inclusive as opposed to alienates people. Party vote Labour. And Stuart Nash, you've got an MP who is experienced, who is sitting around the cabinet table when the big decisions are being made. I think in these, uh, in these troubled, interesting times, as we move from responding to recover and rebuild, Napier deserves someone around the cabinet table uh, who was experienced. That is me. Party vote Labour, candidate vote Stuart Nash. Thank you. Stuart, Deborah, Katie and James, thank you for a good debate and all the best for the election. May the best woman be the new Prime Minister. Ah. And, and to the listener, we'll see you tomorrow at 1pm for the Tuki Tuk candidates debate on Austin on a special right here on Radio Kidnappers. Thank, thank you, you Andrew. Andrew.